song And every hate are all the same I'm feeling like the world is Skip Bayless And I'm LeBron James It ain't easy eh? I'm the path I'm on But put the world on my back Cause I'm that strong Long journey I've been on From the very start And the way I die off With this iron heart It's the kid King James Acting 330 Oh, yeah, that is Kevin Durant and LeBron James in a song from 2011. And if Spider Studios gets only 994,000 more retweets, Robin, we can get the entire track released. If you're watching on Facebook Live, tell us what you thought of that small snippet. I'll ask you, music aficionado that you are, was this song fire? 2011 wasn't a great year for LeBron. Uh, you know, I, I think that... Papelbon gets name checked. <laughs> well, Papelbon rhymes with LeBron. That's less King James and more the Sacramento Kings of, of rap. And what I'd be really worried about is the old-time basketball guy saying, not only are these guys buddies, but they're rap friends as well. But, you know, for a million retweets, we'll hear more than a peep. Right now, LeBron probably worried about that sweep. He probably is worried about the sweep. They should get you on the track. You have to go back in time, perhaps. Well, Maggie, one thing we do know, it's a wrap for any team that doesn't have LeBron or KD right now, with the only hope being the draft. And we've got the latest big board for all those fans out there hoping to land the next star. All right, here's 10 through 5 on our big board. I'm going to go for this with the last name, Frank Nalikna. Nalikina, of course, it's just French Frank, the 18-year-old from Brussels. He's a 6'5 point guard. At number nine, Zach Collins, seven-footer from Gonzaga, one-and-done player, of course. Of course, Jonathan Isaac, a New York native from FSU. At number seven, Malik Monk, SEC Player of the Year, of course, from Kentucky. And the ACC Freshman of the Year, Dennis Smith Jr. from NC State. Let's go to numbers five through one. Ooh, somebody's not going to be happy about this. Not good for the big baller brand. UCLA's Lonzo Ball at number five, who was the number two prospect when SI unveiled the big board, the first big board back in January. Definitely not the shoes. <laughs> At number four, Kansas freshman Josh Jackson, the 6'8 swingman, arguably the best athlete in the draft. At number three, Jason Tatum out of Duke, polished a wing scorer as anyone in the draft at this moment. Tatum was number two on the last big board. That spot now occupied by? You know who, Kentucky point guard De'Aaron Fox, lightning fast, a lockdown defender. Many experts have compared him to John Wall. Also, Robin, not a big fan of Kevin Durant's shoe line. Well, talking trash before he even gets into the league. And number one, where he's been since day one at college, Kansas, Josh or no, I'm sorry, uh, do-it-all guard Markel Fultz of Washington, of course. We did the profile of him at SI.com. And, of course, he's a D.C. native, so, of course, he's got a little D.C. in him. I know you're from around there as well. Of course, you can head to SI.com. The full big board, prospects 1 through 50, will be on there. The editor of the crossover, Matt Dollinger, is here. Now, this is a ranking of just the most talented prospects in the draft. Now, let's talk about fit. The Celtics have the number one pick. What are they going to do with it? I think they're going to go with Markel Fultz. Uh, you saw really? Jeremy Wu's big board. He's been the number one prospect all year. And I think it just makes sense for them after what they saw this postseason. You know, the Cleveland Cavaliers are still there. LeBron James isn't going to have any decision this summer. It's tough to go through LeBron. And I think the Celtics at this point realize they're not a tweak away from beating him. I think they think they got to think long term. Markel Fultz is the way to go. Now, De'Aaron Fox ranks second overall, the Lakers holding that second pick, but they have a point guard in place in D'Angelo Russell. What would compel the Lakers to take Fox over Lonzo? You know, I'm not buying the Lakers are worried about the Lonzo ball distraction thing. This is the Showtime Lakers. Jack Nicholson sits at half court. Kobe Bryant was there for 20 years. This isn't a team that's worried about a little too much attention. So I really don't think that's going to be what it comes down to. I think it's going to be who fits better next to D'Angelo Russell and Brandon Ingram. So I think Lonzo Ball is a really good fit next to those two guys. I think Russell and him can share the rock. Russell had a crazy usage rate last year. That'll come down. I think he's the best fit in terms of talent, and I think that's ultimately what's going to be the decision. Okay, so you believe that Lonzo is going to the Lakers. I do. I really do. I think De'Aaron Fox uh, – is probably as good of a point guard as anyone in the draft. But in terms of fit, Lonzo Ball can shoot. He moves the ball. He doesn't need to be as ball dominant. It makes more sense. Okay. The Knicks, they've got the eighth pick. Phil Jackson said he believes Carmelo Anthony should move on. Who can help with that gargantuan rebuilding process? Uh, maybe Adam Silver could intervene. <laughs> I don't know. We need I, help from above. I know James Dolan can't help. We've, <laughs> that's been abundantly clear. You know, the Knicks, it's a staring contest between Carmelo and Phil right now, and I'm not sure who's going to blink, you know. It doesn't really make sense for Carmelo to move on because there's not that many teams where he can go and win right now. Who's going to want to absorb that contract? At a minimum, he gets to play for the Knicks and he gets to live the life he wants to live, apparently. But there isn't a team really that's out there that says, 
go to Carmelo wants to be on this team. He's going to win a title. The Cavs aren't going to take him on. You know, the Warriors aren't taking him on. So he could end up in a terrible situation that looks even worse than the Knicks. Wow. Is that possible? I didn't even think that was possible. I was going to suggest the Clippers. Even that's not worse than the Knicks. He's still relevant in New York. We still talk about him. You know, he's still we still do these kind of question and answers things because we see Carmelo as one of the top talents in the league, and he just hasn't been relevant since, you know, the Denver Nuggets were good. So I, I really think that the Carmelo-Knicks relationship should end, but I don't think either one of them is smart enough to probably put an end to it. All right, very interesting. We'll see if something perhaps happens on draft night. I don't know if the Knicks even have any flexibility there. Not a lot. Doesn't look like it. Of course, you can go to SI.com, the draft big board, top 50 prospects. You're going to want to check that out. Let's get to some other NBA topics because apparently – Las Vegas not immune to recency bias. ESPN asked a handful of bookmakers to set odds on a hypothetical series between this year's Warriors and the 95-96 Chicago Bulls that went 72-10. and 10. Five of the six in Vegas had the Warriors favored. Let's look at the odds from the world's largest sports book. That would be Westgate. You could take a look at the board. The Warriors would be a six and a half point favorite on a neutral court and overwhelming favorites to win the series. Matt, are these odds fair? Yeah, this is tough. When you when you compare generations, it's it's never going to line up right. I mean, Michael Jordan would hate these guys, right? He would hate everything the Warriors stand for. He would despise these guys to his core. I can't imagine how motivated he would be to beat Kevin Durant and Steph Curry at this point. So, you know, how do you factor that in? What's the, what's the line on that? The Warriors are way more talented than that Bulls team. I don't care, you know, how highly, val how highly you value Scottie Pippen. The Warriors team has more talent. So when it comes down to that, I get the line. Yeah, I think the Warriors, this year's Warriors team, beats any team in NBA history handily. If we're talking about under these rules, I mean, I could see them dusting the 96 Bulls by 40 points in a given game. It's not fair. I'm not saying, I'm not taking away from them because, you know, Michael Jordan, everybody knows about his work ethic. He would work on the, the three-point shot. Sure. He would hone it. But you drop them into this era, they got no chance. Yeah, you drop them into this era, but I don't like that because, yeah, yeah you don't think that Tony Kukoc would be a better three-point shooter if he wasn't in this era. I mean, you don't think they would actually build a team that had Dennis Rodman and Bill Wennington both on it. It just wouldn't make any sense. No disrespect to Byron Russell, but uh, the Warriors would throw Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, Kevin Durant, and Andre Iguodala at Jordan. He never faced that kind of competition defensively. Yeah. I guess the one thing, though, is that Jordan and Pippen were great perimeter defenders. Absolutely. So perhaps that's one place where they could try to keep the Warriors in check. And Phil Jackson was still coaching back then, not messing around with the Knicks, so it could be more interesting there, too. Phil Jackson hates the three-point shot, but the right. volume of it is so much different. I mean, the Warriors, really, it's two times the weapon for them. They, they took two times more this um, regular season. They've hit two times more per game this postseason. That's a huge disparity. I can't do that math in my head, but two times three, you know, <laughs> six, d divided by the factor of whatever that means, but, you know, it's a big weapon for them. <laughs> and is Steve Kerr coming off the bench, or is he coaching? Not clear. You're going to need three points. Okay. What we were just talking about, it. He, was, he shot over 50% from three that year, 95-96. He would have been playing 40 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they would have had to have. In large part due to the Warriors, the NBA Finals and playoffs have been so uncompelling that we just discussed the fantasy matchup of teams from different eras. But that hasn't reflected in the ratings. So far, the Finals are the highest rated since Jordan's final season in 1998 and the highest ever on ABC. It is the third year in a row for Cavs Warriors. However, with the Cavs down 2-0, are you more or less excited to watch Game 3? Well, the ratings thing makes sense because we've been spending the whole, whole playoffs with our families rather than watching the games because they're just not interesting. So we've waited to watch this series. Have we? <laughs> and it's still underwhelming, but we've got nothing better to do. I mean, look, I, I'm not watching the Stanley Cup. I'm not watching baseball. I'm watching it's the NBA out. Finals. Uh, am I? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, this is it. Whether it's bad or not, I think people are going to stick with it to the end because we've been talking about it for three years now. You know, this is the culmination. Yeah, this is the rubber match, obviously, between Warriors and the Cavaliers. I would like to say that, you know, game three is something I, I want to be watching. I do, unless somehow the Warriors get out to like a 20-point lead, and then I'm just watching because I basically paid to watch because it was my job. If I'm just right. a regular fan, I'm probably finding something else to do. Oh, it's twofold here. I, I think this is the last game where people are looking for a chance from Cleveland. They're at home. The old adage, a playoff series doesn't start until the home team loses. And two, LeBron James is a larger-than-life figure. So no matter what is happening with him, whether it's success or failure, people are going to stick around and watch. Remember, the Heat got 
blown out by the Spurs in that rematch of, of their finals meetings, and, and people still watch that just to sort of see it transpire. Same thing here. Well, you also had LeBron cramping up. I mean, there were some very interesting storylines that were going on with that series, even though the Spurs are, we call them boring, and right. they're from a small market and things like that. But it was a very compelling series. You know, with this game uh, on Wednesday night, actually, it looks like the Warriors just a three-point favorite in that game. So Vegas expecting a much tighter contest. We saw it last year. The Warriors blew them out in games one and two. Cleveland came back. I think as NBA fans, we're all hoping that Cleveland shows some backbone here and comes back because we all want to see an interesting series outside of the Bay Area. You know, we want to see this be a game, but there's a sense of dread deep down, I think, that's inevitable. This team just can't be beat. Yeah, it's just too good. All right, New York's number one sports talk radio host. He hasn't had a hot take in a while, actually, so he's doubling down. Sleeping on the hot takes. At Steph Curry, you said that, not me. Don't come after me. This is Mike Francesa on a show recently. Well, listen, Curry, Curry looked ridiculous on that play. Listen, you know how many times LeBron James has scored over every one of them and not shown them up? It just shows you that Curry doesn't have a lot of class as a player. I'm sorry. He is, he, to me, he, he acts like a clown on the court. Okay, this is classic Francesa. If you're not around the New York area and you don't listen to him, he calls everybody a clown and everyone classless. But, Matt, does he have even a shred of a point here about Curry showing up LeBron on that fancy dribbling, perhaps double dribbling uh, display? No, team two? of course not. Of course he doesn't have a point. This guy's the clown. I mean, he's a lovable clown, but he, he's a clown. Uh, you know, I'm sure he didn't even really watch games one or two, so who knows how much opinion really is there. I feel like... I'm ruining my chance of ever going on Francesca now, right? Yeah, <laughs> only, you only got a couple months left. It's over. He's saying goodbye okay. in December. Okay, before I think, I think I both know you guys don't agree with Francesca. And I don't agree that Curry is classless, nor do I agree that he's a clown. But I do agree that Curry is very demonstrative on the court. We talked about this before the show. The shimmy, which LeBron does not do. I mean, listen, I would say so far, even though the ring total is with LeBron, with the Cavs, and Curry with the Warriors, it's one-to-one. -one. But I feel like LeBron has many more moments over Curry than Curry has on LeBron. So if I am able to cross him up in one particular instance, I don't know if I'm celebrating in game two. So he's not classless. He's not a clown. But Francesa may have tripped on a point there. It's what he does. I mean, he's cocky. He's yeah. a showman. And I like my great athletes to be cocky. I think you have to. It's a prerequisite sure. in order to excel at that level. And Curry celebrates shots before they go in. He yeah. does the, the leg kick up yeah. thing. I don't have the hamstring flexibility. None of us do. He lay down on, oh, yeah. on the, the sideline, you know, chilling out. He did the, the goggles thing with uh, yes. Sean Livingston he's the other night. He's turned around. It's like me walking off the set of the show while we're yeah, still right. in a segment. But LeBron flexes. LeBron yeah, screams. It's all, it's all cousins. They're all variations of the same sort of celebration. And, I don't know. Uh, you know, that is... Um, Hating gets thrown around a lot. You know, it doesn't mean what it used to mean when I was a kid. Uh, the, the rapper Common once said, if I don't like it, I don't like it. It don't mean that I'm hating. Right. You know, <laughs> but this is the prototypical definition of hating on somebody. You know, the one thing I think about it is sometimes like another one-on-one -on -one sport, which is tennis, and they always say that Serena Williams and Maria Sharapova have this rivalry, but they actually don't because Serena beats her every single time they go out on the court. It's not apples to apples, but it'd be like Maria Sharapova acing Serena Williams and then like dabbing on her. Like it's not a rival. You, you can't do that. You can't. Game's still going on. It's it's kind of nice to see the emotion, though, because you sure. do see, you know, people pretend like they don't care. It's nice to see them caring, but also... Curry's a little man in a game with monsters. You know, he doesn't get to dunk on anybody. He doesn't get to power through somebody. It's awesome to see him do these things. And I think it just goes to the Warriors' style, how loose and how much fun they have. Is, And he also knows he's, Draymond Green has his back. So there's that, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, Matt, thank you very much. One of the biggest surprises of the finals, it hasn't been the blowouts. It's the amount of time J.R. Smith has spent with a shirt on. It's shocking. In fact, when it comes to Smith in this series, there really hasn't been much swagger or production from the Cavs party animal. So after a strong showing last year, what's happened to JR? Watch this. Hey, what happened to JR Smith? In last year's finals, he was the Cavs' highest scorer behind LeBron and Kyrie. His timely shooting, especially from deep, was a huge part of Cleveland's comeback. Just look at that plus minus. This year, not so much. His playoff numbers, if you can call them that, are garbage. Dude's minus 30 in just 42 total minutes. So what's the deal? Maybe JR has found the nightlife again in the Bay. Turning to the NFL, yesterday the Seahawks announced the signing of quarterback Austin Davis. 
Pete Carroll, he rationalized the signing of Davis over Colin Kaepernick by saying, Kaepernick's a starter and we have a starter, but he's a starter in this league and I can't imagine somebody won't give him a chance to play. Maggie, I've now heard that Kaepernick is not good enough and is too good to be signed. How can that be? Yeah, it can't be. It can't. And what Pete Carroll said is completely baffling. And if Colin Kaepernick was going to sign somewhere, Seattle really made a lot of sense, considering he has a similar skill set to Russell Wilson, very mobile quarterback, very accurate quarterback. In a lot of ways, Kaepernick does not throw a lot of interceptions, nor has he throughout his career. So I thought that this was going to be a perfect fit. But everything, in my opinion, about Kaepernick went out the window when Brandon, Brandon Whedon was signed to a two-year deal. I mean, to me, it's... There have been so many quarterbacks who are less skilled, who have uh, less of a chance to actually step in if your starter goes down and help your team win than Colin Kaepernick. And you only have to look to Jenny Rentis' uh, column for the MMQB where she talked to John Mara, the owner of the New York Giants, who said, I've never gotten more emotional mail than about Colin Kaepernick. I honestly think there are franchises that are not willing to sign him, even though he can help their team. Yeah, I, I mean, you have to now throw out the play excuse as the sole reason for what's taking place between what Pete Carroll has said, between some of the players that have been signed, and, of course, John Mara, who owns a team that plays in New York, publicly stating that the fan backlash or whatever rationalization he wants to use is a reason against signing Colin Kaepernick. So I'm not saying he's being completely blackballed or his protest is the sole reason, but it is obviously a large reason or a factor behind why he doesn't have a team yet. Austin Davis didn't play last year. I mean, Colin Kaepernick played on a really bad team, and I understand that his statistics definitely took a hit, but he played on a, on a, on a terrible team. I mean, I don't think that he's done playing football. I hope he's not, and I don't think that his skill set, if you saw it last year, necessitates him being out of the league. I think there's only one thing you can really look at, and listen, a franchise can make the decision they want to make, but if it looks like that the teams are potentially talking to each other or colluding to keep him out, well, then you have a big problem. And when you talk about him not being good enough or being too good to be your backup, Come on. This is the NFL, right? I mean, a, a backup becomes a starter like this. And if you are a team that has Super Bowl aspirations like Seattle, it just does not make logical sense that you wouldn't want the best possible replacement for your most valued commodity in the top position in the sport. Also, he, P. Carroll says that he's a starter, but he wouldn't threaten Russell Wilson at all. Wilson's got that job. It's not like he'd have to fight for it in training camp, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. Meanwhile, the NFL Network has come up with their annual list of the top 100 players for the previous season. So after playing just three games last year, the three-time defensive player of the year, J.J. Watt, was ranked 35th. Even Watt found this hilarious. Now, the NFL Network's list is compiled by the players, but Robert Ayers has a theory here, Robin. He says, NFL Network know they'd be making that list up. Players vote on the top 20 players, how they come up with the other 80. <laughs> now, we don't have any, we're not privy to any information about how the NFL Network does come up with this list. J.J. Watt, though, comes in at 35. Robin, do you have a problem with it? Absolutely not. I think he's being a little too humble here, too. I mean, if I'm ranking the players going into the season, do I factor in that he's coming off of an injury? Yes. Does that drop him? Of course. But does it drop him down to the, the bottom of the barrel? No, I mean, 99. Well, like where was he on this list last year? Number one, weren't we talking three, about, you know, like this guy being the, the non quarterback who's better than everybody else in the NFL. And all of a sudden he gets hurt like pretty much every NFL player during a season. And he's a bum. So I, I don't think uh, that it's a problem. OK, I feel like lists like this are always very difficult when you're dealing with injuries. But I have a little free advice for the NFL Network, how you can fix this problem. Just make it a ranking of the top 100 players going into next season. Boom. I just solved your problem. Meanwhile, three-time Pro Bowler and All-Pro Chris Johnson still looking for a team. With 10,000 yards and a Super Bowl ring on his mind, CJ2K stopped by our studio recently. The NFL Offensive Player of the Year in 2009, you rushed for over 2,000 yards that year. Now, Chris, you're entering your 10th season in the NFL, but we have to just rewind and go back to the combine for a moment. Your long-standing record, nine years with the fastest 40 time, was broken by John Ross of the University of Washington. How'd you feel that day? Oh, uh, man. Uh, you know, I didn't think it was going to get broke or whatever, but, you know, our records meant to get broken, and 
I knew one day it eventually happened, and you know it happened. So it is what it is. Are you disappointed? No, I ain't disappointed. I can't say I'm disappointed. Like he ran four two two, I ran four two four. Both of those still real, real, real class speed. So, did you think for a second that maybe it was a miscalculation or mistiming, and you still held the record? Yeah, I definitely did. Like when it first happened, and it was unofficial, and then they showed the. Um, me as the yellow line in him, like at the end, I pulled off on him. So I was like, I know he ain't beat the record. And then when it came back that he beat it, it was like, it was mind blowing. Oh man, well, I don't know. We're gonna have to wait, I think, a long time for anyone to break that 4-2-2 for yeah. sure. You know, you once raced a cheetah. Mm -hmm. um, you revealed recently that Usain Bolt and yourself, you guys almost raced, but couldn't agree on the distance. Have other people asked to race you over the years because of your electric speed? Yeah, it's been a whole a whole lot of people asked the race, but you know, I I don't ever really get into it. But you know, anytime somebody is like the best at their sport, uh, like as far as he the fastest guy in, in track, the fastest guy in the world, you know, everybody want a chance to race him or whatever. So, you know, I wanted to get that opportunity, but it didn't happen. Okay, so you never got the chance to race Usain Bolt, but give us another unique one. Who was someone who wanted to race you who you thought this is completely out of left field? Um, Raja Rondo. <laughs> Rondo. He yeah. came to you. Um, I had a um, I got a friend that actually played played with him on the, on the, when he was on the Celtics, on um, Marquise Daniels, and sure. you know they used to talk in the locker room. So one day he Marquise actually called me when when he was with Rondo or whatever. And, you know we went back and forth or whatever. They actually said something about it on um, I think it was on Sports Center or something, but yeah, no, it never happened. It never happened. No. I mean, that wouldn't even be competition for yeah. you, right? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've said recently you still have two big goals out there, football wise. You want to top 10,000 yards rushing in your career, and you want to win a Super Bowl. If you were guaranteed just one of those before you eventually hang it up, which one do you want? I'd say the Super Bowl. Yeah, you know, that's every person. Every player go, no matter if it's football, basketball, what it is, they want to be a champion. They want to win it all. They want to play in that big game and, and, you, and win it. So if I had to pick one, it would be win the Super Bowl. Okay, so now you're looking out there for a team. You've said before you don't really want a backup role. You want to be involved in the offense. If you're not able to find what you want this season, would you go as far as sitting out a year, or would you eventually take a reduced role? Um... Like how it is these days in the NFL, every team gonna have two guys. They're gonna have two running backs. So if I'm not able to go somewhere where I'm a starter or anything like that, I don't have a problem with going somewhere where, you know, I gotta share the load or at least have a role of being involved in the offense. Okay, so this is not to play favorites or to tip your hand, but what team out there when you look at the landscape makes the most sense to you? I'm not sure right now. You know, it's a couple people I just, you know, um, like especially Arizona, you know, I'm familiar there. Um, I know the playbook, um, me and, me and Bruce Aarons, you know, we got a player coach relationship, you know, we talk all the time on the phone. So, um, uh, you know, there's way my option and trying to do what's the best thing for me. Final one on this topic. Do you believe you will be signed before training camp starts? Oh yeah, I'll be signed. Yeah. Before training camp starts. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of big name running backs on new teams heading into mm -hmm. this season. Obviously, Adrian Peterson going to New Orleans heads line it. Jamal Charles going to the Broncos. Marshawn Lynch with the Raiders. Mm -hmm. LeGarrette Blunt with the Eagles. Eddie Lacy, the Seahawks. Latavius Murray with Minnesota goes on and on. Which one of these fits seems like the best f in your opinion? And who do you think is going to end up having the best season on a new team? Um, you know, I've always been a, been a fan of uh, Adrian Peterson and then the type of offense they got and then with Drew Brees. Um, I think he's going. I think he's going to help them um, win more games this year. The NFL is relaxing their touchdown celebration mm -hmm. dance policy. Now you always had this sort of fun yeah. kind of. I don't know what, what did you call that. The Chopper City. Joke. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay. So would you now expand on that? Take it even further with the rules being relaxed. I don't know. Probably. Probably do a couple of different things. It just. It's always a feeling thing, how you feeling once you get in the end zone, the atmosphere of the game, all those type of things. It just all depends. Okay, I uh, want to get your thoughts on Ty Montgomery. He's a mm -hmm. guy who switched from wide receiver to running back for the Green Bay Packers. He came out and recently said that 
he would rather play running back, mm. even if it's more punishing on his body. He could be more productive for his team, even if it meant a shorter career. He said he'd rather not be the fourth or fifth wide receiver on a roster, even if it meant he could play for 12, 13, 14 years. You've told me before that if you could do it all over again, you would not have been a running back. You would have been a cornerback because of how punishing the role of running back is. What do you think about what Ty Montgomery had to say? Um, I feel like it's a different situation because if he play receiver, he's going to be the fifth, fourth, fifth guy, you know, they barely even play. But being running back, that's where he getting the most playing time, the most touches. So in his situation, I can understand why he want to play running back. Um, instead of sitting on the bench, he go and play running back and be actually involved in the offense and be involved in the game. Chris, thank you so much for coming mm -hmm. in. We really appreciate it and can't wait to see where you end up signing this year. Thanks for having me. Thank you. We close with Justin Bieber. Is it too late now to say sorry? Yes. The Beebs was tweeting about last night wearing free jerseys he's given. What does he mean? Here's his explanation. Tweet number one. I support all sports. I'll put any jersey from any pro team. If I'm whack for wearing jerseys they give me out of love, then I'm whack. Tweet number two. Leafs above all, but other than that, you give me any jersey that looks cool, I'll throw it on. And tweet number three. I also don't know enough about sports to really have a valid opinion, but I do enjoy sports and enjoy any high-level sports game any team. Yeah. At first, I was going to call him a sellout until that third tweet when he says, listen, I really don't follow sports. He's a Maple Leafs fan. He's from Toronto, and that's about it. But here's my thing. I can imagine potentially wearing any person's jersey if it's a basketball jersey and you loved the player to an extent. But when it comes to, like, football or any other sport, I can't imagine being a fan of one team and then wearing the other team, another team's jersey. I just can't wrap my brain around. See, if you're identified as a diehard for a particular team, then no, you, you can't do it, right? You can't be a Yankees fan wearing the Red Sox jersey. But if you are Bieber, man of the, the people, the I world. guess. Yes, uh, then I, I think you, you can do it. Uh, you know. Doesn't this shed a little light on Drake, though? Everyone was clowning him because they always think that he's such a front runner. He's just wearing the cool jersey that he's getting gifted for free. And if he's whack, he's whack. But he didn't tweet explain it, or unless he had one of his ghostwriters do it. I don't know. Oh, he's going to come after you. Well, he oh, probably I'm, won't. I'm real he scared probably of Aubrey. Won't. He probably don't, won't. Don't come after me, Aubrey. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's a hell of an actor. Um, Robin, thanks so much. I think we got to the bottom of that Jersey situation there with Justin Bieber. Thank you for watching on Facebook Live. Of course, you can check us out tomorrow. Robin will be back at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. You can stick with SI.com, though, for all the latest news. And follow us on Twitter. We tweet, not like Bieber. We tweet mostly about valid things about sports. Uh, that's at SI Now Live. That's where to find us. Have a fantastic Tuesday. We'll see you tomorrow.